All right, I'm cool. super excited um, to be Sam here with Ship. We're going to talk about kind of the next generation of service mesh and how Ship has implemented some really um, amazing features to get the like most bang out of your buck from service mesh. And so I'm going to hand it over to Brandon here to kind of talk about Ship. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I'm Brandon Barrow, senior engineer at Shipt. I work on our developer platform team, so uh, we expose a uh, self-service platform for developers uh, that um, we hope they enjoy. Uh, I'm pretty passionate about developer experience, uh, so that's kind of what I, I try to do every day and uh, work primarily on Kubernetes, Go, uh, Service Mesh, and API Gateway as of late. Uh, I'm Nick Nellis. I'm a field engineer at Solio. I help companies like Shift implement Service Mesh um, in complex, multi-cluster, multi-environment uh, environments. And so um, today we're going to talk about uh, some of the complexities and um, features that we got out of Service Mesh in Shift's environment. All right. So who's Shift? Uh, we were founded in 2014 in Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, we're in multiple cities, but still headquartered there. Um, serve uh, over 5,000 cities, partner with 150,000 or 150 retailers and 3,000, uh, 300,000 shoppers, um, and uh, cover 80% of households nationwide. Uh, technology wise, uh, we primarily are a polyglot environment, uh, mostly uh, microservices written in Go. Uh, got about probably 400 plus running across multiple different environments. Uh, a lot of clusters, uh, 60 plus, I think, overall environments. Um, we uh, process about 3K R uh, RPS on average. Uh, services uh, communicate mostly HTTP and some gRPC. And uh, yeah, we have some other languages as well, but most, mostly everything's written in Go. Uh, so beginning, uh, we sort of reached the point where we might need something like a service mesh once we started in, uh, doing a cloud migration. Um, so initially, most of our clusters taught uh, sort of within themselves using cluster.local.dns. Uh, we expose a YAML file. Tell me if you've heard that one before. Uh, for developers in their repo that allow them to sort of define what dependencies they have, inject it into an environment variable, and it uses the, uh, the native uh, Kubernetes DNS. Uh, however, when we started implementing multi-cluster, um, this became problematic, um, and uh, so we needed a way to handle that. Um, the uh, yeah, so initially we we settled on sort of a redirect method by implementing external services uh, on or external name services on every cluster for every possible destination. Um, so that we could redirect uh, geographically to the nearest cluster where the app actually lived uh, if somebody requested something that wasn't on their cluster. Uh, but that was sort of a stopgap solution. So we had an engineer start POCing Istio in our environments. Um, if he's in the audience, Keith Maddox, uh, now at Microsoft. Um, and so he sort of spearheaded our uh, initial foray into service mesh, uh, which um, inspired a nation. Um, so yeah, initially just Keith was working on it, uh, and uh, we, we sort of reached an implementation in staging uh, that worked pretty well. Uh, we deployed all of our SDO CRDs uh, via um, Helm chart. It were pretty much invisible to the developer. Uh, we did expose a very loose abstraction um, over the SDO primitives, but for the most part, uh, developers at Shipt just kind of want things to work. So uh, we... we uh, we definitely came up with a, a default optimization for them. Um, so after that, though, uh, we decided uh, in, to partner with Solo uh, to re-architect the whole solution using Glue Mesh uh, in order to get uh, a few features we, we really wanted, like um, uh, we wanted to be able to manage everything from a single control plane uh, across multi-cluster, um, as well as uh, define um, our, our uh, primitives in uh, uh, a higher level uh, CRD. So, yep. So, one, yeah, one thing we wanted to kind of highlight on here 
is when you, when you take on implementing a service mesh, or even when you're getting started, um, that typically falls on your operations team. Even though service mesh is for developers, um, it's usually an added responsibility for your ops team. And operations teams are typically one of the smallest teams in your company, and they're really highly centralized um, knowledge base. And so something with like SHIP is they had somebody like Keith go out and learn service mesh. Um, but over time, they actually had to um, kind of share that knowledge with the rest of the team. And so they kind of realized that over time, now Keith is at Microsoft, that the rest of the developers and other operators had to go out and learn service mesh. Um, and so one of the key learning points, I think, from that experience was that uh, Shift needed to kind of expand that knowledge base and kind of re share the expertise and then, um, you know, insulate themselves from, you know, having one person have all the keys to their service mesh. And so there's a lot of um, ways that you can actually uh, kind of learn about service mesh uh, from the early onset. If you're thinking about using service mesh, I would encourage you to get a team involved rather than just a single person. Um, I think some, there's some really great books out there that teach you about service mesh. For example, the one Issue in Action that Christian and Lynn wrote is pretty much a full stop, zero to 100, if you want to learn service mesh, or Istio through and through. And so having your engineers kind of ramp up early is going to pay off immensely in the long run because you'll be spreading out that expertise. Yeah, so why service mesh? Um, Ultimately, uh, initially, a lot of our uh, multi-cluster solution depended on hairpinning, so we didn't we had multiple hops, or we didn't need them to be. Uh, even the uh, the DNS redirection we were using required hitting an ingress on another cluster in order to actually reach the service where we wanted to talk uh, service A to service B. Um, so it worked, but it was undesirable. There were a lot more optimizations to be made. Um, we had uh, we have robust failover at Shipt. Um, it does require human action right now. Uh, so some developers like that, but I know a, a large percentage of them really would prefer things to just kind of happen automatically. So Envoy and Istio and Glue give us sort of that automatic failover capability we needed uh, to feel confident. Um, uh, the developers also wanted more options around how their services were routed to. So uh, closest locality, uh, weighted routing, uh, that sort of thing was desirable uh, from uh, an implementation standpoint for us. Uh, and then we have an InfoSec team. They love zero trust. They love MTLS. They love policy-based enforcement. So uh, definitely wanted that. That was a plus for them. Yeah, I think yeah. one thing that um, everything that Brandon listed, that's what service messages do. But they actually had one extra complexity is that their applications are spread out through a number of clusters. And so this uh, CNCF survey kind of shows here that the number of people running just one cluster in production is decreasing and multiple clusters in production is increasing. And so again, kind of service mesh largely when we talk about it is just single cluster, but they wanted those same features for all their clusters. So yeah, why don't you talk about your architecture a little bit and we'll talk about the hairpinning and stuff too. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, initially we were in pretty closely coupled to clusters to handle ingress for this given service running on that cluster. Uh, each service had sort of a cluster local um, external URL that was available internally for other applications uh, if they were not on the same cluster uh, as that service to, to talk to. Um, so we needed to decouple the cluster abstraction from the equation when deciding how to route to an application service from outside or inside the mesh. Um, we, did, we wanted developers to really have one URL to use uh, to you know, rule them all, uh, inside, outside, whatever, not care about cluster, um, completely remove that from the equation. Uh, and we wanted also a single management plane, like I said before. Uh, so we were having to, in our CI CD pipelines, deploy SEO CRDs to each namespace and each cluster where things were deployed. Uh, so coordinating that, um, you know, it worked, but it's much nicer to be able to just deploy a single 
uh, CRD to manage multiple complex Istio primitives uh, to a single management plane uh, per application. Um, we wanted something relatively plug and play. Uh, Solo glue is that. Um, and uh, driven by GitOps, so we don't do anything manually. Um, everything is managed through Terraform, Go, and Helm charts. Yeah, and I think one thing here is that it wasn't just Istio to make this work. Um, they needed to combine their cloud DNS as well. So they have a, a, essentially a unique DNS name for every service. And so when your application needs to reach another one, it resolves to that um, DNS name and then routed to a gateway. And I don't know if you guys use HTTPS, but you lose some, uh, once you leave your cluster, you're losing some of the identity of your application. And so not only are you hairpinning, but it's not as secure as it could be. Yeah, whenever you leave the cluster to go to another cluster at the moment in the, the legacy architecture, it is over HTTPS. So you do have that additional um, computation for, for decrypting the HTTPS traffic and, and terminating down to the service level after that. Um, so MTLS directly kind of helps with that. And uh, this is the, the, the kind of new mesh architecture. So. You can see instead of having to go ingress, uh, we go directly uh, east-west, uh, wherever a service is, using our um, singular URL, uh, which Nick will talk a little bit about later. Um, the uh, glue knows how to intelligently route. Um, if it knows about it on the mesh, it can route directly, even if the URL is resolvable to an ingress IP in the environment pertaining to like an, a regular Istio ingress. Um, it won't use that if it knows it can reach it uh, through less hops. Yeah, so I think there's a, kind of a lot to unpack there um, in terms of service mesh features. I think one of the big things um, that most of us start with when you start using service mesh is an ingress gateway. Um, we use Istio, so it'd be Istio ingress gateway. And it has like some really great features, service discovery, observability, MTLS, um, and then like a failover outlier detection. And that works really good in a single cluster, but the architecture changes quite significantly when you have multiple clusters. And I think that's what they, and so if you, if you decide to deploy two gateways, now you just have two single service meshes deployed to, or two clusters, you have two single service mesh deployments to those clusters. And the problems get a lot more complicated. And ships solve those by using cloud DNS to help the routing from there, but it's not, because they're not connected to each other, again, they were able to only use HTTPS instead of MTLS. Um, and kind of you were, they were stuck uh, applying configuration to each cluster individual. So you were treating your clusters more like pets than cattle. And so that brings us to um, kind of this tiered gateway approach. And what's really um, kind of unique about what Shipt is doing with this is that it's a mesh integrated API gateway. And so you have, they have this kind of global, regional ingress, I think it is, um, in that now you can extend those same service mesh features that you have in a single cluster to any number of clusters. And so that gateway um, in the regional ingress is aware of all the applications running in those other individual clusters. So when, an, when a request comes into that regional gateway, it knows where that checkout service is, so it can apply best path routing and it can actually use MTLS from the ingress gateway to the checkout service. And so you can actually, you are now getting a multi-cluster awareness, you get multi-cluster observability, and then you get full MTLS from cluster to cluster. Um, one great thing about moving that ingress gateway to a regional thing is now Shipt has one specific spot where public traffic enters their environment. And so they can concentrate on that from an operational side to put all of your security at that one spot. And so we have one single ingress that you can put all of your attention into to make it more reliable and better and put more security at that layer. So they use um, a number of tools, OIDC um, and JWTs for um, their external traffic. Yeah, so this is more a slide around sort of how we did the initial like stopgap solution before implementing Istio. So essentially, we, we created services that corresponded to every potential destination um, that a service could live uh, on every single cluster. 
Um, that way, if a service asks for uh, app a .app .service .cluster local, that it would end up getting handled by an, a service with an external name that would redirect to the ingress on the next cluster geographically where the app actually lived. Uh, so that's that's sort of how it worked. Uh, it was it it was pretty neat, but um, ultimately was doing more work that Istio solved in a much more graceful way. Um, so uh, yeah, here we are. Uh, and then, yeah, so multi-cluster DNS, we wanted each app to have a single URL. So we have some, you know, a naming convention that pretty much is like a, an A record wildcard that any service can be routed to via host-based routing. Um, and uh, that's all app developers have to know about in terms of, um, you know, knowing how to reach a service, whether or not it's injected through some sort of service discovery or whether they need to hard code it for some reason. They, they know exactly how to reach another service uh, regardless of where it is across like different app domains. So like we have um, machine learning clusters, we have app clusters, we have data science clusters, all those kind of things. It doesn't really matter. Now you just have a singular URL to use, uh, which is fantastic. Um, originally we started looking at using something like DNS rewrite with core DNS to solve this problem, uh, but Glue does it intelligently uh, through Istio and um, yeah, using uh, virtual IPs, uh, as long as it knows about something in the mesh, you know, instead, uh, if, if it didn't necessarily, it would use the, uh, the Istio ingress. Yeah, and it probably sounds complicated because it, it pretty much is. Um, and we're gonna show you here how it works and then how um, a multi-cluster service mesh actually fixed a lot, improved this uh, architecture. But you wanna, yeah, you wanna talk about how the routing kind of works? Yeah, so this was uh, uh, a, a basic example, um, if a little convoluted, of, of how it worked, which, I mean, it was convoluted because it naturally was. Um, so, like, we, we basically in the Helm chart defined a list of uh, locations, and uh, uh, based on if compute existed in the region, we would tell it how to route uh, based on that geographic list of locations. Um, and uh, so it kind of looks something like this, uh, where we, we do a bunch of redirection um, using DNS, and uh, uh, Istio is much more efficient at that. So here's Istio doing it. Uh, so we have uh, app foo talking over MTLS uh, to uh, another cluster um, directly to another service. Um, and or using the load balancer if it doesn't know about it. You wanna go back one slide actually? I think there's something really interesting. Um, what they had to do with their cloud DNS is that all those uh, load balancers that exist, they essentially had those ingress gateways listening on all the hosts and then if they would receive a request for an application that didn't exist in that application, they would forward it to the correct cluster. And so using a lot of like DNS magic and then routing in the ingress gateway, they essentially gave all of their applications, you could essentially hit any gateway and reach that, um, that application. But it also came at a cost of like, increased complexity and then extra hops. And so then kind of what we're showing in the next slide is we're actually able to keep the same functionality that they wanted, which is high availability and any gateway can respond to any request. But we could actually make that a lot more intelligent and just figure out, because of global service discovery, we knew where that app, the destination was, and we could actually short circuit that extra hops and significantly reduce the latency between the calls. Yeah, those are good points. Um, we're gonna kind of take a little step back to kind of explain some of those concepts here. Um, the first one is, we talked about how they were using HTTPS before. With, uh, multi-cluster service mesh, we were able to retain the identity of the calling application. And so now, as in this example, we have, I think, a closed application calling a checkout application. And because of uh, MTLS, multi-cluster MTLS with service mesh, we are actually able to keep that identity of the closed application. And so the checkout application could actually determine if it wanted to allow that um, request to happen or it could deny it. And so not only did we improve on the HTTPS, we actually retained that identity. So we improved the security of the multi-cluster routing that they were doing. Um, the second thing, uh, you're probably wondering how we were able to short circuit those hops. 
And that's because of the intelligent DNS that's added in Istio's proxy. So there's a DNS server that runs in there that actually will take that, it will resolve host names for you before actually forwarding on um, to like the cloud DNS. So we're hijacking that DNS. We're looking for those host names that they, do, they made for those services. And then we can actually return back the best path for your uh, application to call to get your response. And so what I um, put up here is kind of the flow pattern of the Istio proxy and how it determines um, where it should go. So at the top there, your foo application is calling bar.ship.com. And so it's asking the Istio proxy, where is bar.ship.com? And so Istio hijacks that request, that DNS request, and returns a virtual IP. And so it's a, just an internal IP address that's used by Istio and only known by the proxy. And so then the foo application is gonna make that request. And that request then goes back to the proxy and the proxy sees that virtual IP address and then decides where is the best path to route. And so in this application, or in this example, the proxy determined that the bar application in US East was the best path, um, but it returned a 500 error. And so the proxy can automatically then retry and go, oh, there's a next best path to go. Let's try the US West one. And so then it can automatically retry that HTTP request, and that one returned to 200. And so to the end application, all it did was just make a request to bar.ship.com, and the Istio proxy did a bunch of intelligent routing and returned you a 200 error, or 200, uh, okay. Go ahead. Yeah, so here I'll talk a little bit about uh, our GitOps pipeline of how we actually handle all this from code to, uh, to Kubernetes. Um, so, uh, like I said earlier in the talk, developers essentially define what we call an infraspec uh, YAML file in their repo, which is a pretty similar pattern to anything else you've probably seen, um, where we define loose abstractions over Kubernetes and Istio primitives, uh, also handle like uh, cloud, cloud storage and S3 and whatnot, that kind of thing. So develop, it's like a one-stop shop for developers to define their application environments um, and uh, what compute and data stores they want. Um, so there is a service mesh abstraction there too, so that they basically can define all of their weighted routing. They can opt in. So right now we primarily have an opt-in approach. Um, so developers say they want the sidecar, they want the mesh to be enabled. Um, at, at some point in the future, they, they won't need to do any of that because of ambient mesh, but um, looking forward to that day. Uh, in, in the terms of uh, how the actual file gets parsed, um, it, we listen to uh, webhooks uh, with a, a few different services from git pushes, creates, issue comments, that kind of thing, um, and parse that infraspec uh, into a templated Helm chart, uh, and then deploy those in parallel to all of our clusters. Uh, with the addition of glue, uh, we deploy an additional glue mesh Helm chart to our management clusters. Uh, that are the control planes for the multi-cluster mesh, and that sort of defines the glue CRDs that are needed, um, and uh, developers um, pretty much just use that pattern. Um, they define de specific environments and regions they want to deploy in, and we match whatever their strategy is, um, and uh, it works pretty well. I think one, like, interesting thing you've done with your um, GitOps is that they allow their developers to opt into all kinds of service mesh functionality without even essentially knowing that the service mesh is doing that. So they expose to them um, like retries and priority based load balancing and all this stuff to allow the developers to have that freedom to pick those um, features that they need out of a service mesh and abstracting it away from the actual implementation of it. Yeah, most developers don't care about service mesh. Uh, at, at, at our at, at shift, um, they just want to enable their business application functionality uh, to work in a better and more efficient and faster way. Um, so, luckily, they have a great platform team to handle that for them. Um, so, let's see, GitOps. Yeah, this is this is more of the same. Uh, developer commits. Uh, we have a couple of different uh, CI CD tools that ultimately take their Docker image, deploy, uh, push it to a a repository and then uh, we use concourse to actually pull that uh, and uh, build the helm chart and deploy it to the, all the different environments um, and uh, yeah so that's that's pretty much our conclusion 
Um, we love service mesh. Uh, next step is for us to start moving our edge routing to the left. So uh, API gateway is next. Um, and uh, I'm excited to be on the forefront of that, uh, partnered with Solo. And I think like one great thing is the architecture for SHIP didn't change and those original objectives that they had around multi-cluster routing and uh, global host names for their services, we were able to retain all of those features that they had, but we just improved upon them. We made them more secure. We made the routing more intelligent. Um, and we allowed them to keep doing this, their development with all of those same features using service mesh. We just enhanced it. Um, and then we, with service mesh, we plugged that into the GitOps pipeline as well so that all of service mesh kind of worked with ship's environment. Cool, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I think we have a few minutes for questions. Um, I really, really enjoy this talk and congratulations, Brandon, to your team that you were able to hide the service mesh complexity for your application developers. That's really cool. So any questions from the audience? All right, I'll pass the mic around to you first. Okay. Since you are closer, but I'll get to you. Thanks for uh, the presentation. Can you guys share um, what you've done in terms of improving security? You just mentioned that you made security uh, more, an Istio more secure with Solo or uh, routing more intelligent. I mean, do you mind, are there things you can share on what specifically you've done? Yeah, basically, like kind of the two big things is um, by retaining that service identity in multi-cluster MTLS, you now have a lot more um, kind of metadata that's traveling with the request as it leaves one cluster to another. And then so it allows your applications or your servers to make more intelligent decisions at, in terms of security. You know, should they allow or deny? And essentially that with multi-cluster MTLS, you can now lock down the entire environment and only trust known applications. Um, and then secondly, at that uh, gateway level, because that gateway is integrated with service mesh, we were able to focus our security specifically at that layer. And so adding um, capabilities like web application firewall and um, OIDC and JWT and all this stuff at that single point, um, it kind of like acts as like a DMZ for outside traffic in entering ship's environment. And then in terms of um, the routing decisions, we kind of talked about the decisions that the Istio proxy makes um, in terms of, because there's global observability, it can look at kind of your environment, uh, applications your environment wide. And so we know if there's an application that's closer to yours in a different cluster, it'll prefer to go to that one first. But then if it's not available, it can fall over to another region. Uh, great presentation. Uh, so you talked about multi-cluster deployment. Uh, just wanted to understand in terms of Istio providing this out of the box versus the implementation that Solo has done, like what are the differences or additional features that have been brought in, if any? And secondly, uh, you also talked about automatic failover. Was it just related to like pods going down and the service mesh taking care of ensuring that those pods don't have traffic going in or was there something more than that? Uh, yeah, to your first point, so um, what we did, we built everything on top of open source Istio. Essentially what we were able to do is stitch all of those individual Istio deployments together and make them aware of what they needed to know about in the other clusters. And so all of the kind of routing and all that decisions is just open source Istio. We just configure it at an extremely fine grain level. We create all kinds of Istio um, CRD or configurations using the CRDs. Um, to make that make that happen, and then we just implemented um, this week uh, full PKI infrastructure using Istio, Cert Manager, and Vault to give the full um, security trust chain between all of those clusters. Um, does that answer your questions? I, I think the only thing um, on there that Solo has is the at the API gateway level, we built some extra filters into the API gateway, like Web Application Firewall and OIDC for that um, specific use case. Um, but that's still built on the Istio Ingress gateway. Yeah, in addition to what Nick said, developers um, basically can define if they're interested in um, total network outage in terms of failover or if they are concerned about specific like 5xx errors, uh, the rate at which they are received, um, and then a, you know, a gestation period of when the route is actually removed from the configuration. 
Um, so that's, that's pretty much how the failover is handled. Uh, they define multiple regions and then an outlier config. And uh, it's, it's very basic, like Istio uh, functionality.